Good morning, Valley View. Well, are you in the full swing of school? This is the first week of school for most of our children here in Arkansas, and, and I know it's an exciting thing for kids to be able to get away from the cabin fever, to get back in the classroom. It's an exciting thing for parents to kind of get them back in school, if you know what I mean. But it is, you know, there's a lot of interesting emotions and things that happen when you dive back into school. Because some, there's always that notebook that you forgot to get. I had to go at 10 o'clock the other night and pick up three new three-ring binders that somehow we forgot in the school supply list. And you got to pick up this and you got to get that. And you got to get prepared and you got to change your schedule to get them to school on time so you can get to work and all the things that are involved. I remember hearing of a, of a young girl who went to school and her mother after the first day asked her, she said, honey, what'd you learn today in school? That's a typical mom question to ask. What'd you learn today? To which the daughter said, well, I don't guess I learned very much. And her mother was surprised, so she asked, well, what do you mean you didn't learn very much? She said, well, they're making me come back tomorrow. <laughs> so she didn't thought she learned very much. You know, she thought one day she'd get it done. When our kids go and when they receive an education, we want them to learn so many different things, don't we? We want them to learn about math and about science, and we want them to learn about English, and we want them to learn how to write and how to figure things out. We want them to have the right preparation for life. We also want them to learn things like how to interact in a social setting, how to learn to relate to other people, those intangibles that you can't get from a book, but that you do get from being around other people, being involved in activities and in large groups. We want them to learn some common sense. I want my kids to have common sense, and I hope it takes. Sometimes I hope they have more common sense than their daddy does. As was illustrated this week on Friday afternoon, I went to mow my grass, and I had to move our old pickup that doesn't have any air conditioning out of the yard to get the mower there. I rolled down the window and I noticed as soon as I started the engine, a red wasp flew out from behind the driver's rear view mirror. And he spun around a couple times and went back and crawled back behind. And I thought, what a curious thing. So I leaned over, the window's down, I leaned over and looked a little closer. I thought there might be a, you know, a, a nest or something in there. Sure enough, he came out with a vengeance and hit me like a dive bomber right in the chin. I'll tell you, I screamed and hollered and, and thank goodness it wasn't in drive because I fell back on the seat and was waving my arms and rolling all around. And I thought, now I'm done. Shouldn't everybody know better? Have enough common sense that you don't go looking for trouble where it is. And so we want our kids to learn to not do dumb things. We want them to get common sense and to learn social interaction, and to learn reading, writing, and arithmetic. All the things that give them a preparation for life. But when we look at education and what it's really all about, all of those things are important. But none of them are the most important. Because parents, the most important thing you can teach your children is to have a knowledge and a love of their God. It is the most important education that a child can receive. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, we have this familiar passage where it tells us in verses 5 through 9 as, as Moses is laying out the law for the Israelites and is explaining all of those Ten Commandments and what they mean and, and what they're supposed to, to model in their lives in order to be pleasing to God. He says, you shall love the Lord, verse 5, your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your might. And these are the words which I command you today. And they shall be in your heart. And these words which I command you, they shall be taught diligently to your children. And shall talk, you shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. And you shall bind them as a sign on your hands, and they shall be as frontless between your eyes, and you will write them on the doorpost of your house, and even on your gates. He says, your primary responsibility is not just to love your God, not just to obey His commandments, but to make it your priority to teach your children to do the same. 
And you don't just do that one time. And you don't just do that by relying upon school, even if it's a Christian school, or relying upon church, or relying upon devotionals, or youth group, or Bible classes, or even worship and sermons. It is your responsibility, parents, to teach your children every day, in every place, in each and every setting, What's most important in life is you should love your God, honor Him, and obey Him. This is the foundation of the most important education that a person can receive. In Proverbs chapter 1, verses 8 through 10, the wisdom writer says, Listen, my son, to your father's instruction, and don't forsake your mother's teaching, for you are a garment to grace your head and a chain to adorn your neck. It says, listen to mom and dad because their responsibility is to give you a right education. In Proverbs chapter 1, chapter 4, excuse me, verses 1 through 5, the proverb writer will also say, listen to some, my sons to your father's instruction. Pay attention, gain understanding, for I give you sound learning, so do not forsake my teaching. For I too was a son to my father, so do not forsake the teaching. And still, tender and cherished by my mother. Then he taught me and he said to me, take hold of my words with all of your heart and keep my commandments and you will live. Get wisdom, get understanding, and do not forget my words or turn away from them. So what these passages describe, both in Deuteronomy 6 and in these and many other places in the book of Proverbs, is that this process is a partnership between parents and their children. The parents have a responsibility given from God to give them a right education. That before arithmetic and writing and science and English and before even social interaction and even common sense, that the most important foundation of that education is to teach them every day, in every way, in every place, and in every setting about God, His will, and to love Him. And then on the other side of the coin, the responsibility of children is to listen, to learn, and to absorb, and finally, to model those teachings. In Matthew chapter 8, 28, that was read for us just a few moments ago, we have this extremely familiar text called the Great Commission. And what's intriguing about this is that we talk about two principles, and we tie them to this passage all the time. When he says, Go ye therefore into all the world, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always to the very end of the world. We focus a lot on that idea of commission, of evangelism, and we rightly should. That this passage is the, the charge that we should go into all the world, be it our backyard in Jonesboro, Arkansas, or be it across the water in the Philippines, or in Africa, or in India, or in Guatemala, or wherever else we may send the Word of God. It is our charge as believers in the church to take the gospel to the whole world. And we know that's true and right and should be emphasized from this text. And we do so. And then he also talks about the importance of being baptized. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we know that there is an essentiality connected with baptism in regard to our faith. That it is the, the crown jewel, the culmination of our faith after belief and repentance. So we'll come to this text and we'll talk about the importance, but not just the importance, but the essentiality of baptism in evangelism. And we rightly should. But there's another instruction in this text that is often overlooked. Because he says there thirdly, and teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. You see, as much a part of the Great Commission as is the principle of evangelism and the importance of baptism is this third principle that we must teach. That we must, if you will, educate. And it's more than just educating those that we teach about Christ and furthering their knowledge of His will and His church. 
It's the principle and the idea of teaching in every aspect and every part of our Christian faith, which no doubt begins at home as we strive to teach and to rightly educate our children. You see, sometimes it's been said that this part of the passage is the great omission in the midst of the great commission. Because we so often overlook it. The importance of teaching. You see, parents, it's vastly important that we teach our children. And the first part of this message is to us. As we send our kids out into the world, as we watch them grow, as we watch them learn, the principle of responsibility that we take upon our shoulders to instill in them the faith that we have in our hearts so that it becomes their own faith, active, alive, real, and powerful. You see, it's more important to teach our children about God than it is about multiplication tables. Those are important. But it's vastly more important that they know about God. It's more important that our children know evidences for the resurrection of Christ than they know the evidences of physics or of physical science. It's more important that our children understand the reality and the truth of creation than it is for them to understand the theories of Darwin and natural selection. You see, it's our responsibility because whether we are assisted or we are not assisted by other forms of education in our life, be it school or church or the media or wherever it may be, it still falls upon our shoulders primarily to give them a foundation of the knowledge of God. See, we cannot assume that Sunday school, a Christian school, devotionals, or worship will train them. We have to not only take the responsibility of teaching them, we also, and this is vitally important, we also make, must take the responsibility of modeling those teachings. You see, you can tell someone something and try to impress that knowledge upon them, but if you do not act like you believe, it will never take hold. There was a book written several years ago by a former college student who recounts his story in science class in college. And there, I believe it was a physics class. And they were talking about the laws of physics. And they were each given assignments to come and to prepare a, a demonstration of one of the different laws of physics. So he decided to prepare a demonstration of the law of the pendulum. Now you know what a pendulum is. It swings back and forth between extremes. But the law of the pendulum says that no matter what, if you start it at a certain point, no matter how strongly it swings, once it reaches the end of its arc and comes back, it will not quite come to where it was begun. It won't swing. It'll lose a little bit as it goes until finally it loses all of its momentum. So as he was going to demonstrate this, he asked the professor if he believed in the law of the pendulum. To which the professor asserted, most no, certainly he did. He said, I taught it to you. Of course I believe in it. So the young man had prepared a demonstration. He hung a big weight from the weight room, a 45-pound weight, from a rope to the ceiling. And he took and he placed a chair in the room. And he asked the professor to sit in the chair. And he pulled that heavy weight right up to the professor's nose. And he let go. That heavy weight swung on a pendulum. It slowly reached its arc. It hung there for just a moment. And then it began back the other way. And as the professor saw it coming back right towards his nose, about halfway through its swing, he leaped from the chair. The point the young man made was this. He may have taught us that, but that proves that he didn't believe it. Now eventually he found a brave student to sit in the chair and sure enough, he let that barbell go. It came back and it came close and the boy was sweating bullets, but it didn't touch him. Because the law is always true and that student believed it. Folks, you can teach your children about God, 
all day, every day, but that they don't see the example of you sitting in the chair and putting your life on the line and believing it every day, then they'll never absorb it and live it out in their own life. You see, it's crucial that we live our faith, not simply teach it. It's been said before by a preacher long ago that it doesn't matter what you teach your kids, they're going to turn out like you are anyway. And the principle there is this. Teaching is important, but action is imperative. Living it is essential. The second part of this message is to students, to young people, to children. See, children have a responsibility to listen, to learn, to absorb, and to follow. In Ephesians 6, 1, it tells us, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. And likewise, in 1 Corinthians 15, 33, Paul famously said, don't be deceived, Bad company corrupts good morals. George Washington, the first president of these United States, said it this way. He said, associate with men of good quality if you care about your reputation. Because it's better to be alone than to be in bad company. It's better to be alone. It's better not to have any friends than to have bad friends. You see, we emphasize this when we talk to our young, young people. Because we know the absolute truth that we are influenced by those we choose to spend time with. To select our friends wisely has an absolutely profound impact on the direction of our lives. There was a book entitled Safe People that was written by a couple of psychologists several years ago. And in the book, it's about 200 pages long, three quarters of 150 pages describe what they call unsafe people. And it's a typical list of what you would expect. People who are unwilling to admit their own mistakes. People who are religious, but they aren't spiritual. In other words, they talk the talk, but they don't walk the walk. They're self-righteous rather than being humble. They blame others rather than take responsibility. They tell lies rather than truths. They're concerned with I instead of we. It's selfish motivation in everything they do. And they're a negative influence, an influence for wrong, rather than a positive influence for right. And with that in mind, there's a passage in Proverbs chapter 17 that I think is very intriguing. Proverbs 17, 12. It's very vivid. Just imagine this, if you will. It says, better to be a bear robbed of her cubs than a fool in his father. Now I've seen a bear one time in the woods when I was hunting years ago in, in Idaho. And I took a shot and I missed. I think it's because I was shooting at a bear. I think that probably had something to do with my shaky hands and poor aim. Because a bear is a terrible thing. But it's an especially terrible thing if it's been robbed of its cubs. But the writer says it's better to meet that bear robbed of her cubs than a fool in his father. The book of Proverbs deals with the idea of foolishness and fools on a great number of occasions because there were fools then and there are fools now. And the foolish people of this world seek to bring about foolishness in the lives of others. That's what unsafe people are. So how do we choose safe people? Well, the authors gave simply three just brief descriptions of safe people. And they're very simple. Number one, one, those who draw you closer to God. Number two, those who draw you closer to others. And number three, those who make you a better you. They make you a better person. And that reminds us of the words of Jesus in Matthew 22. Verses 34 through 39. Where when Christ was asked, what is the most important of all the commandments? He simply responds, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And the second is like unto it. Love your neighbor as yourself. 
He says these are essential to character, to persons, and to pleasing God. He says all the law and the prophets hang on these. In other words, you can get the rest of it right if you start with this foundation. Love God with all your heart. Love other people. And that makes you a better person. So as you choose your friends, as you choose your, those who you'll spend your time with, who will influence you in your life, we ask you, young people, choose people who help you draw closer to God, not farther away from Him. Choose people who help you draw closer to others. If they're, if they're always back-talking other people or gossiping or trying to drive a wedge in other relationships, choose people who draw you closer to others, not farther away. Choose people who support you and lift you up and help you. Choose people who make you a better you and help you become a better person. You see, it's so tempting to follow the, the fashions and the fads of this world. Queen Elizabeth, hundreds of years ago, was, she had several daughters who went to school and they, of course, were educated with all of the nobility of England. And her daughters came home as daughters do. And her daughters said, Mom, Dad, they're, they're, wearing all, they're wearing all these new fashions. The latest things out of Paris. And the daughters wanted to wear those fashions that were in vogue and that everybody was wearing at the time. To which their mother, the queen, refused. And she said this. She said, you are daughters of the queen. And daughters of the queen don't follow fads. They create them. So the message to you is this. You are children of the King. And you don't need to follow any foolishness. You need an example and influence others rather than allowing them to influence you. As we go back to school this week, there will be a number of challenges all through the year. But if we remember to put God first, to prioritize the love for Him and His obedience and His will, it'll be a great year. If you're subject to an invitation this morning, if there's someone here who perhaps when we talk about God as our Father, we make these analogies, that doesn't quite apply in your life because you've not yet made Him Lord and Father. If you need to come and give your life to Him in repentance and in baptism, don't delay anymore. This is the one. Or if you need to as a parent, say, I just want to do better. I want to improve in regard to how I'm teaching and instructing my children day in and day out. I want to improve not just on what I say, but on my example. Today may be a good day to make that commitment to your family, to the entire world, and to God. If you're a young person who says from this point forward, I'm going to take the things that my parents have taught me and apply. Whatever your need is, come right now as you stand.